new sort of tools, these intruders of modern technology, you can't bring them in unless you create a culture because as this article right here, very well written article from Jeffrey H. Patton in The World Ahead, and this is dated September 1995. I wanted to share some of this particular article that caught I and I attention, and it's called Behold Technology, and the subtitle is A Future World Enriched or Held Captive. And going up into the article at a particular point, there's a Neil Postman, one who I think coined the terminology, he's credited with the terminology uh, technopoly, technopoly, technopoly as a culture makes a god of technology, makes a god of technology. So it's very important to understand how this article dated more than 10 years ago, because it's 2012 now, and this article is September 1995. Once again, to credit Jeffrey H. Patton for this article right here. And we find this to be a very, very appropriate and a timely article as well, because um, Neil Postman, he calls the Bible society, the biblical society, the most uh, detailed account of an ancient tool-using culture we have in his book, uh, Technopoly, page 25, quote, the name tool-using culture, it derives from the relationship in a given culture between tools and the belief system or ideology. Now, keep this in mind as we're discussing um, the real biblical origins of true masonry as well, or the craftsmen, the workmanship, the basically that's ancient technology. We're talking about techniques and the word techniques and technology and wisdom, biblically speaking, link. So now the real overstanding of this particular issue of uh, technopoly and technology and this um, modern so-called God of technology can be overstood biblically by researching wisdom and wise. As the Almighty says, he will use the foolish things to overcome the wise. And though the world has wisdom, technology, Jah also has wisdom and technology, and his wisdom and technology overcomes the world. So the name of tool-using culture, a uh, culture that uses tool, it derives from the relationship. And I want you to make a note of this, the relationship in a given culture between tools and the belief system or ideology. The tools are not intruders. They are integrated into the culture in ways that do not pose significant contradictions to its world view. So on this point of uh, uh, the origins of masonry versus so-called Freemasonry, we want to see if we could bring up this some of the former um, picks that we had assembled for our former um, teaching on the tabernacle and some of the tools right here. For example, we have this particular, you, you know, this is the plumb line, you know, this is the square. Let's see if we could bring up the that Egyptian um, the, the picture from, I think that was from, um, okay, not that picture right there but from, uh, who's the brother, um, Dr. Ben's, Dr. Ben's book. We might have closed, closed that picture out, but let's see if we can find this picture. Oh, here it goes right here in the background. So as you can see right here, and this goes along with what uh, Neil Postman writes of in his article or his, his, his book, dated, I think, roughly in the 1990s on um, this modern technological so-called technopoly culture. So here we see ancient Egypt. We see the signs and the symbols of the word, the tools of the holy temples and sacred and, 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 the, and the sacred, um, the mystery systems, the tools of the unmoved mover, the eye or the ja, the ya, the word, the tools of the craft, the stone builders of holy temples and sacred shrines, of the mystery 
systems of the Grand Lodge here of Luxor, what's known as Luxor, Egypt, right? So here we can see what Neil Postman is speaking about. If we just read over it again, Neil Postman, who calls the Bible Society the most detailed account of an ancient tool using culture that we have, and that the name tool using, it derives from the relationship in a given culture between tools and the belief system or the ideology, the belief system or the ideology of that particular culture. So we can see this clearly demonstrated when we look at ancient Egypt, when we look at the Bible, when we look at ancient Ethiopia, ancient Egypt, the Hebrews, so forth and so on. But now we must behold Technopoly. You understand? So now let's behold Technopoly, right? A future world. Is the future world enriched, as we've been told, that this is a future world where all this technology is going to have such so called rich blessings? For all the people in the world, you know, everything's going to be wonderful because now they have all this technology that can do all these so-called wonderful things. But is that really the case? Is that really the truth? But when we look at the ancient cultures, the, um, the tools that they used, they were not intruders. They were integrated into the culture in ways that did not pose significant contradictions to that particular culture's um, worldview. What is this present so-called end-day, last-day culture, the end of the Gentile world system um, culture? What is, you know, what is their culture? What is the culture? What is the, the worldview? Now, in the ancient cultures, the, their theology, and we see this clearly demonstrated when we point, just to go once again to the, um, the Luxor, you understand, the tools of the ancient craft. Let's pull this down once again. And this is a good demonstration of what is written right here. Their, tech, their theology, their theology, it took as a first and last principle that all knowledge and goodness come from God or come from Elohim come from the God, the triune God, or in ancient times referred to as the gods, and that therefore all human enterprise must be directed toward the service of God, the service of Elohim. Theology, not technology, provided people with authorization for what to do or think. It provided order and meaning to existence making it almost impossible for techniques to subordinate people to its own needs. But this is not the case that we have in this so-called spiritual Egypt, as we once again behold technopoly. So let's get a little bit into this article that we said um, is from the, the World Ahead. It's written by... Uh, Jeffrey H. Patton, and we're going to go through this and try to highlight this. This is like the audio version of it, although some of the matters mentioned in it um, require a basic knowledge of history, and we'll point out certain videos and reference sources that I think we have available if ones want to follow up on some of the historical parallels that are mentioned in this particular article by Jeffrey H. Patton. So Shimon Peres, Israel's foreign minister, remember this is dated 1995, is certain of the fact that on the eve of the 21st century, human society is on the brink of monumental changes. Quote, we are not beginning a new century, we are beginning a new era, end quote. He is talking about the development of a global information society which will create a new economic, social, and political order. Or we can just well say it, a new world order. The information revolution is driving global trade and international investment on, and on to enormous growth rates. Asian countries, 7.8%, Latin America, 3%, Central and Eastern Europe, 4 to 6%. Henry S. Rowan, 
professor of economics at Stanford University, he adds this, quote, a process is developing which promises within a generation to make the majority of the world's population rich or at least richer than they are today. End quote. This is from the Deutschland, um, June 1995, pages 16 to 17. Now we can get into what he said right there. You know, this 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 is like the serpent speaking once again. But we're going a little bit ahead of ourselves. Today, the information highway based on computer-driven technology is creating a set of true believers as politically diverse as American Vice President Al Gore and Speaker of the House Representatives uh, Newt Gingrich. Everybody is jumping on the high-tech bandwagon, quote, the 21st century should be as great a century of exploration for humanity as the 16th century was for the Europeans or the Europeans. Now, that is an exciting future. Just list some of the changes we are living through. Laptop computers, cellular telephones, molecular medicine, home security systems that talk, microengineering, high-definition television, the video store, the list goes on and on. This is Newt Gingrich speaking, actually, from Los Angeles Times, quote, into the future, led by visionaries. August 2nd, 1995. So let's ask the question. Is humanity's present marriage with high technology going to result in exciting bliss? Or are we being seduced into an abusive relationship by a wired up, digitally dirty old man who baits us with materialistic baubles. So, are we going into this exciting bliss, or is it just e-bliss, you understand, who is seducing the people into an abusive relationship by a wired-up, digitally dirty, old, can we say white man, since this is coming out of the Gentile, who baits us with materialistic baubles, question mark. Now, Intuit Corporation recently announced that, quote, 19%, 19 of the largest financial firms in the U.S. are joining it to enable their customers to conduct banking transactions online. The service will use Intuit's personal finance software program. The first online banking transaction will be a historic moment, not unlike the first automobile sale or the first commercial airline flight. It will signal a commercially viable use of a new technology that may ultimately eliminate what until now we have considered the retail aspects of banking, stock brokerage, and more. The effect on the banking and brokerage business and their employees is going to be profound. The retail sales forces of banks and brokerage houses may shrink substantially, as may the ranks of financial planners. The number of bank and brokerage buildings may also shrink. This is from the Wall Street Journal. Quote, uh, your home computer will soon be your banker and broker, August 1st, 1995. Now, some effects of this incredible high-tech transformation of our economic culture are just beginning to hit home. Now, notice this, this article, once again, is 1995. Now, we're, we're past 2008 and the whole Wall Street collapse and everything, and we're in 2012 now with this so-called recession, inflation, whatever they call it, bad economy, right? So we can see now it's really beginning to hit you understand? Even more, the effects are coming on us. But we're talking about what is, what, is the, what is the root of the matter. We're going to the root of the matter. Quote, something is wrong with America's economic boom. After nearly four years of ever stronger growth, 
people's wages should be going up faster than their expenses. For most people, they're not. Rising wages has become the number one economic issue in the nation today. Now, this is the New York Times in an article from January 8, 1995, entitled, Recovery? Not in your paycheck. Quote, in a survey that sampled 20,000 U.S. households, the Census Bureau found that workers who left a full-time job or were laid off between 1990 and 1992, saw their wages drop an average of 23% upon regaining full-time work. The study also lends support to the view that the new jobs are, quote, distinctly inferior to the ones they replaced, end quote, said James Meadoff, not Madoff, but James Meadoff, a labor economist, economist at Harvard University. And this was from Wall Street Journal article from January 25, 1995, named Census Bureau Confirms Eroding Wages. And remember, that's 1990, that's 1992. You understand? So if that serves us correctly, that's like about almost like 20 years ago. You understand? Roughly almost 20 years ago? Yeah, this is 2012, right? So that's about, you'd say, about 20 years ago. Ain't that something? Now here's the second here's the second article. So please stay stay with this. I think this is a very important article. Like like I said, this is in the old um, world ahead um, Christian magazine. One of the one of the Christian denominations that put it pretty square, you know, biblically based and are uh, pretty honest in their biblical perspective. You know, generally speaking of things based on the old plain truth. Uh, Herbert um, W. Armstrong group of folks. You know, there's some differences, but we'll touch on this and that. But this article right here is just very, very interesting. I think it's uh, it's timely considering where we're at, you know, and what we what we're facing. So the next part of this article it says is subtitled "Rebels Against the Future." Really, question: Rebels against the future? In today's marketplace of ideas, a number of voices are warning us to weigh the consequences of this new information revolution and to evaluate publicly if we are ready to pay the price. One of the foremost of these, quote, rebels against the future, end quote, is Kirkpatrick Sale, who has written a book of the same title. Sale recounts the struggle waged by English cottage textile weavers, the English cottage textile weavers who rose up to destroy the, quote, automated, end quote, looms powered by the newly invented steam engine during the early years of England's Industrial Revolution in 1811 and 1812. Now, some people say, well, what does that have to do? This is 2012. But notice, um, Newt Gingrich, uh, insider, you know, he said something leading up to this election, saying that this election is like the election of 1860. In this uh, video that's talking about the, um, the riots, the food riots, and the other kind of riots, as we see more and more collapse in the society, also says that many, you know, federal agents talking about the crisis that they foresee happening with, um, you know, rising costs and, 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 and job losses and government costs. And I really predict, not even predict, but I see that a lot of this is going to seem, the economy is going to seem really good right now leading up to the election. And then after the election, you know, we're going to then be forced to confront the real economy the way it is. That there are some improvements going on, but a lot of this is cosmetics and um, not saying that the President Obama is doing this for re-election, but basically, is, you know, it's the pattern of Washington, it's the pattern of presidency and, you know, incumbent presidencies and so forth and so on. And I think everyone basically knows it. So the word is already out there. You know, and there's a new DVD we have available, too, if you haven't checked it out, um, The Civil Unrest 
you understand, the food riots. I don't know if you can, if I can see a good clip of this right here. But let's see if we can, um, this right here, civil unrest and the riots right here, this particular vid right here, which is talking about some of the things, you know, some of the things that are going on with the economy, how to prepare for these food shortages, so forth and so on. Because this is this is global people, but we're seeing a very important connection in this um, in this uh, technopoly. You understand? In this technology, and we're going to see the connection with with the 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 trick in the mythology, biblical narrative of the Ganetta Aden or the Garden of Eden. But let's go through this a little bit more so we can connect those dots. So he, he's, he's making a connection with the, with the um, early years of England's Industrial Revolution, 1811 to 1812. There was a group called the Luddites. These English laborers, they sought to preserve their skilled heritage of cottage-level hand-weaving which provided employment at a living wage in reasonable conditions. The economic and social effects on the weavers by industrializing textile production were disastrous, similar to what, what, what's going on now with like Walmart and everything being made in China or India or other kind of third world countries that can, you know, give to the corporations and the, and the industries, you know, lower prices for more output, so forth and so on, so they can sell you back the products and you're losing your jobs and so forth and so on. So you get to see this kind of like, um, this kind of uh, rat race, really rat trap that ones and ones are, are living in, right? So, so this, the economic and the social effects on the weavers by industrializing textile production were disastrous, like the mom and pop stores, so forth and so on. Employment and wages dropped precipitously. So people lost their jobs, and those who kept their jobs were making less while prices were going up. Quote, the work that in 1800 required 27 croppers, which are textile workers, to do, in 1828 could be done, according to a parliamentary inquiry, in a factory by three men, of modest skill and two children. Did you get this? That the work that in 1800, in 1800, those, those work that would require 27 croppers, 27 textile workers to do. Just 28 years later, this could be done according to Parliament's own inquiry in a factory by three men of modest skill. And I mentioned this before, the modest skill is like they know how to tell time maybe basically or hear the bell or, or the alarm, and they know how to press a button, you understand, to turn on and off things. You know, basic, basic modest skills. You understand? And two children, two children. Yes, children, children of, of, of less than 10 years of age were working in these factories, too, in Europe, in, in good old, merry old England. You understand? So let's, let's recognize where this exploitation that we see has gone globally really comes from. And this is from Kirkpatrick Sales' book, um, Rebels Against the Future, 1995, page 23. Now, families were impoverished. Sound familiar? Does it seem familiar? Families were impoverished. A man's wages, get this now, a man's wages dropped from 36 to 40 shillings per week to 10 to 14 shillings. Look at that pay cut right there. From 36 to 40 shillings per week, it dropped to 10 to 14 shillings. Now check out basic food. Basic food for, for that time was in England was cabbage and potatoes. Right? So basic food for survival, cabbage and potatoes, it cost the average family 12 to 14 shillings per week. Now, you just do the math yourself. The wages, the man's wages drop from 36 to 40 to 10 to 14. And for his family, food costs for cabbage and potatoes mainly would cost from 12 to 14 shillings per week. Does this sound familiar? Working conditions deteriorated, reducing labor for all practical purpose to wage slavery. Where well, people are working, but they're working for little more than 
so-called slave wages. You know, the, the joke is you don't have to pay a slave nothing, but it's just like they're paying them nothing. For the first several decades of the Industrial Revolution, men, women, and children toiled six days a week behind locked doors for 12 to 14 hours per day as a rule. You know, and, and this is the same thing that we have going on now for a lot of these celebrities and others who give their name or have some products they do, and they do it in a third world country, you know. And, you know, like the Jordan sneakers, that's one example, that Kathy Gifford or whatever her name is. You know, there's a bunch of examples like that. You know, these are your, these are your idols. These are the people who you worship, you know. They'll lock you behind the door for 12 to 14 hours making that same product that you couldn't even buy in, in, in the whole year's time. But a factory's fines and physical intimidation, which meant that the women and the children were beaten. You understand? This is white-on-white -white violence. But, you know, happy for them, you know, the whole slavery thing helped to mix it up a little bit. Women and children were beaten if they fell asleep. So all of this enforced compliance, you know, trauma-based mind control, you know, all the beating and harassment, you figure, okay, you know what, I don't get beat, I'm not, I'm, I just do what you want me to do. Quote, the real challenge of the Luddites, this community that did rise up, that had a little mini-revolution, you understand, was not so much the physical one, which was destroying power looms against the machines and manufacturers, but it was a moral one. It was a moral one. Calling into question on grounds of justice and fairness the underlying principles of unrestrained profit and competition and innovation at its heart. You see, but if you talk about these things, somebody's going to say, oh, you a socialist. You were communist. You were socialist. Interesting. Communist China is the one that make on that Walmart stuff for real cheap, while a lot of folks who, who 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 had some work are losing their work because now they can, you know, you know how if you don't know, Google it. You know, Kirkpatrick Sale he sums up the Luddites' warning, the Luddites' warning to a generation undergoing a high tech information revolution. Quote, whatever. Its presumed benefits of speed or ease or power or wealth, industrial technology comes at a price. Industrial technology comes at a price. And in the contemporary world, that price is ever rising and ever threatening. Indeed, inasmuch as industrialism is inevitably and inherently disregardful, of the collective human fate and of the earth from which it extracts all its wealth, it seems ever more certain to end in paroxysms of economic inequity and social upheaval, if not in the degradation and exhaustion of the biosphere itself. From page 21 of his book, these are really serious issues and really timely issues to consider. You know, saying beyond the Twitters, the Facebook and the laptops and all this other Googling and all that, to really recognize where are we going? You understand? Know Is the technology serving us really or are we being forced to serve the technology? Today's automation enabled by computer information power, quote, has eliminated vast numbers of jobs across all sectors of the economy in all industrial nations, maybe 35 million of them in the last decade, according to page 225. Now, remember, this is a 1995 article. You understand? And when you put all this together, let's just go on further. It says, while many of these job losses have so far been primarily in manufacturing. Remember when the manufacturing people were losing their job, people working in factories and other kind of stuff. People were like, well, I work in the office, so from so on. Many additional job losses will occur in the service sector. So various businesses that would need somebody now with a few, you know, a few apps. They can use an app, you understand? <laughs> One app can get rid of 
can get rid of um, how many jobs, how many families are going to be adversely affected, how many relationships, broken families, all sort of social uh, generational kind of curses come out of this that we have to recognize. Quote, in fact, a 1992 Carnegie Institute study concluded that 6 million more manufacturing and no fewer than 38 million office jobs were at risk to automation with no sign that anyone has any idea where to fit the displaced workers from the next page, page 226. So imagine this, all these job losses that have gone on over the past um, 10 to 20 years. You see any of those jobs coming back? Think about it. You see any of those jobs? So what do people do now? You know what I'm saying? Where do they turn? You know what I'm saying? Technopoly, a brave new world. This is the next part of the article, Technopoly, a brave new world. You've heard that a lot in the media. There's a movie about that, too. Check it out if you can. Brave new world. It's out there. I don't know if we have it available, but if we don't and we get it, we'll put it up there, Doc Videos, WWWLOJ Society. But try to check out that that. that that movie, um, Brave New World, this portion of the article, um, Behold Technopoly, is Technopoly a brave new world? Question mark. As the leader of the Western world in 1995, America has entered into a culture and state of mind that respected author Neil Postman calls Technopoly. Postman sees Technopoly as a culture that makes a god of technology. The ultimate authority in a technopoly is technology. Quote, those who feel most comfortable in technopoly are those who are convinced that technical progress is humanity's supreme achievement and the instrument by which our most profound dilemmas may be solved. They also believe, or be eve, information is an unmixed blessing, according to Neil Postman's Technopoly Vintage Books, 1993, page 71. In this new digital era, human progress is secondary. In this new digital era, Human progress is secondary. Technological progress is paramount. Efficiency, productivity, rationality, and profitability are everything. Since the first industrial revolution in the 19th century, machinery has been taken for granted that people were sometimes treated as if they were machinery was also allowed by manufacturers, even if reluctantly. But today, Technopoly wholeheartedly proposes that human life must find its meaning in technology. That, quote, human beings are placed at the disposal of their techniques and technology. That human beings are, in a sense, worth less than their machinery, page 52. Now, if this is not the height or rather the depth of insanity, but really, biblically speaking, of idolatry, you understand, of idolatry. And we can see the connection of the love of money, you understand, being the root of all evil. You understand, because a lot of this technology can be used to improve human life, but they put a price you understand? They put a price on that because the love of money is the root of all evil. And the God of this world, you understand, is Satan or the prince of the air. Right? So human beings in this sense and the sense of the God of this world and, and this behold technopoly 
is worth less than their machinery. This is why you're seeing a lot of the hip-hop videos, a lot of music videos, you know, the computer kind of voice and, you know, the morphing and the hybridization between so-called man and the machine. You're seeing in a lot of these kind of movies, you know, where people are, you know, being taught that the machine has feelings and the machine can think and it can sense. And, you know, this, we, can, we can trace these things also back to very common sources as well. You know what I'm saying? And behind the whole thing, you know, to cut to the chase is Satan Yata Regamen Yuhun. But technopoly, it cuts mankind off from an understanding of the transcendent purpose of human life because it exalts the technical fact as truth. You get that right there? This is a very well written article right here by Jeffrey H. Patton. In, in the world ahead, this particular article. He says here that technopoly, it cuts mankind, it cuts humanity off from understanding or, as we would say, overstanding the transcendent purpose or the transcendental even purpose of human life because, because, because it exalts the technical fact as truth. That technically, if it's a fact, then it's truth. In the 19th century, quote, with the emergence of uh, technocracies, moral and intellectual coherence began to unravel. So as uh, technocracies in the 19th century began to emerge, the moral and the intellectual coherence began to unravel, almost like left brain, right brain kind of thing. What was being lost was not immediately apparent the decline of the great narrative of the Bible, which had provided answers to both fundamental and practical questions, was accompanied by the rise of the great technological narrative of progress. Pages 59 to 60. So these um, technopolis, they believe or they be like Eve in information. They be naive in information, more and more of it, without context or any means for society to evaluate its worth. Now, these are key themes for I and I and I and I teachings and I and I ability and and seeking to comprehend anything. We have to put it into context. So these technopolis. They be naive in information, just more and more of all kind of random. That's why they say that now they're going to trace your, you know, your, your movements on the cell phone through your apps and, and when you, you know, all kind of crazy stuff because it's more and more information. The more and more information that we have, the better we can serve our customer. But anyway, that's the whole point in itself. But there's no context and there's no means for society for people, for you and me, for I and I to really evaluate, to get a value of whether it's worth anything or not. So it's just forced on the people, you understand? And they don't even think, you understand? They don't even see the context of it. Quote, like the sorcerer's apprentice. I thought this was interesting that they made this quote right here. But like the sorcerer's apprentice, we are awash in information. And all the sorcerer has left us is a broom. Information has become a form of garbage, not only incapable of answering the most fundamental human questions, but barely useful, barely useful in providing coherent direction to the solution of even mundane problems, even the basic so-called worldly problems. The milieu in which technopoly flourishes is one in which the tie between information and human purpose has been severed, pages uh, 69 to 70. So you see that the, the, this connection between, between um, the information that we get and what's the human purpose? Is it information that leads to any purposeful, or is just a lot of random, a lot of random? Um, it's, it's a form of mind control, really a form of mindlessness, in in that sense. But this uh, Czech Republic president um, Vaclav 
Havel, he had said to the U.S. Congress, and this is interesting what he says right here. Um, he says, um, we, speaking for him and his kind, you know, the Gentile world powers, he, we still don't know how to put morality ahead of politics, science, and economics. Can you imagine that? Your leaders and rulers, they don't know how to put morality before, ahead of, as the first um, prerequisite, so to speak, of of politics, science, and economics. So morality falls behind that instead of ahead of it, and they don't know how to put it there. He says, we are incapable of understanding that the only genuine backbone of our actions, if they are to be moral, is responsibility. Responsibility to something higher than my family, my country, my firm, my success. This sounds like the teaching of His Majesty. What His Majesty said in many of his speeches, even his speech to Congress, his speech to the United Nations, his speech to, to those, those friends and enemies of the King of Kings and His Christ. This is the very same message of moral. You understand? Rastafari, we teach of the moral theocracy, a moral theocracy, and the responsibility, you understand, to something that is higher than just one's personal family, one's, one's patriarchal country, one's firm, one's success, one's business, one clique, one crew, so forth and so on. Now, here we're going to get into another very interesting part of it. We're going to deal with a tree, right? A tree bearing good and evil. You remember this from the Ganetta Aden. Let's bring this up right here from the Ganetta Aden um, narrative or the Garden of Eden. So let's uh, bring this up right here, all right? Okay, that's from the Ethiopic church right there of Adam and Hewan, Adam and Eve. So here it says, um, a tree bearing good and evil. One of the most iconoclastic spiritual teachers of the 20th century observed, quote, few stop to think about it. But when you do, could anything be wrapped in more mystery than this world's civilization? How can you explain the astonishing paradox, a world of human minds that can send astronauts to the moon and back, produce the marvels of science and technology, transplant human hearts, yet cannot solve simple human problems of family life and group relationships or peace between nations. You know who said this right here? Let's bring let's bring up his uh his his picture too with the King of Kings. Right? This is the one who said this right here. Herbert Herbert Armstrong. Uh, Herbert W. Armstrong said these words and his interview you understand, with the King of Kings is also well worth noting. You understand, well worth noting from the Plain Truth magazine. So Herbert Armstrong, Mystery of the Ages, um, 1985, and this was from page 36. Let's just read this one more, one more time. Few people or few stop to think about it, but when you do, could anything be wrapped in more mystery? Than this world civilization, this mystery Babylon world civilization, how can you explain the astonishing paradox? A world of human minds that can send astronauts to the moon and back, produce the marvels of science and technology, transplant human hearts, yet cannot solve simple human problems of family life. Or... Or, and, and group relationships, or world, or peace between nations, or peace between nations. This is the key. And then this is the key. All right. So, or we can take, uh, as Kirk Patrick Sale, he noted of this present civilization's uh, population, quote, as of 1990, it was estimated that at least a billion of these people live in abject poverty and another 
$2 billion eke out life on a beer subsistence level. Another billion and a half, it is thought, live modest lives on incomes under $5,000 a year. Part of the commodity economy, but without being able to accumulate enough land or wealth to leave anything to their children. And a billion people enjoy a dissipative life at various levels of prosperity. From sales book, page 232. See, this is when we check out now the real, you understand, the real situation. Now, sales, he states that our present technopoly, it confers 85% of the world's income to one quarter of its population living in Western Europe, North America, and East Asia. This leaves 4.5 billion people, three-fifths of the world's population. Remember that three-fifths. Remember they said that the black man in the United States Constitution, you understand, the white racist America said that the, that the black man is three-fifths of a man. Remember that? You know, so now we see that there's three-fifths of the world's population outside of Western Europe, North America, and East Asia. Three-fifths of the population are, in other words, left behind, quote, forced into an existence marked primarily by deprivation, often by wretched misery, probably at levels never known to them. However inequitable their past before the 20th century, page 235. So no matter how, you understand, their past was, coming into this modern world, you understand, has been more hell for three-fifths of the world's population, while two-fifths, you understand, managed to live a dissipative um, life or lifestyle at various levels of prosperity. Kirkpatrick Sales, he gives Technopoly only, quote, a few decades longer, end quote, to exist before collapsing on page 236 of his book. Now, it's interesting because we're tracing this from like the 90s, right, and now we're into 2012. So already that's, that's roughly uh, 20 or so, 20, 22 years. So how much longer, the next seven years, the next 10 years? You think you can go 20 years? Yes. How did we arrive at this astonishing paradox, this paradox that, that Herbert W. Armstrong noted in his book, Mystery of the Ages, from 1985, on page 136? How did we arrive at this astonishing paradox? The answer is found in humanity's ancient narrative of origins, the book of Genesis, this account relates that the Lord God made to grow out of the ground a, a tree of life and a, a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When man was created, the Lord God took the man and put him in a garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, quote, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. Now later, after Ha Elohim, after God created a woman to keep the man from being lonely, a seducing serpent appeared in utopian Eden or in the Ethiopian Eden, to persuade Eve to disobey God. Eve was taken in by this snake's oily information, and her husband gullibly followed her lead. The fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil has evolved into today's information highway. Technopoly has replaced Eden. So Technopoly, let's bring this back front and center. So Technopoly here has 
replace Eden. You understand? Can can you can you receive this truth? Spiritually, what happened was that humanity rejected living by Jah's revealed knowledge, by the true God's revealed knowledge, and instead took to itself the authority to produce whatever sort of knowledge and information it wanted. This has been man's continuing curse because much of the technology that has been developed or we've developed over the years has had evil consequences, whether they were intended or not. Humanity has not listened to Jah's counsel, to the counsel of the true and living God. Quote, the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. Psalm 111, verse 10. You see, Jah is not against the development and the use of technology per se. And neither was his imperial majesty, and neither is Abu Qadus. He employs it in his service, directing its appropriate use. I want you to think about that. This, this is now going to connect in, in the other half, the half of the story concerning the king of kings and concerning Ethiopia and even concerning the, the creeping coup, otherwise known as the Ethiopian revolution, when the serpent, the same serpent, crept into that garden and did the same sort of deception as it was in the beginning, so it is in the end. But in fact, Jah's Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, of the God and Father of our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, has inspired some of the technological and the technical developments. And this is what links us with this particular um, Torah portion, um, reading and feeding from Exodus chapter 35, um, verses 30 to 31. So this is the portion that we're in, chapter um, 35, Chapter 35, verses 30 to 31, where it says, See, the Lord, Yahweh, has called by name Bezaliel, or uh, Basilael, the son of Uri, of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, Yehuda, and he has filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and understanding, in knowledge and all manner of workmanship. And you see, this is the Torah portion, reading and feeding, that we actually um, have been teaching on in this, this week's Torah portion, reading and feeding. Let's see if we can bring up a, um, let's see if we can bring up a picture of, uh, is this, yeah, right here, this is uh, from Tissot's. Tissot's early centuries uh, painting. And we notice it's interesting that though most of the images are somewhat whitewashed, this particular artist, we, we like his skill a little bit better. But here he has um, Bezaliel. You can see Bezaliel. You can see his, 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 his blackness, you know, as the real black Hebrews and the real Jews of the Bible, the Hebrews, the Israelites of the Bible. So this is the Bezaliel that is speaking of. And here we see that Jah says in, in, in his word that um, he has filled this one with the spirit of God in, in wisdom and understanding and knowledge and all manner of workmanship. Now, connecting this with what Neil Postman um, calls the Bible society, the most detailed account of the ancient tool using culture we have in Technopoly on page 25. He goes on to write that the name tool used in culture, it derives from the relationship in a given culture between tools and the belief system or ideology. And we have a good example of that when we um, even touch on and compare this with like ancient Egypt here. We can see that all these tools right here, they also take on certain um, ideological and even religious significance 
within the particular culture and even the connection with the Bible is also very, very interesting. So the name tool used in culture, it derives from the relationship in a given culture between the tools and the belief system or ideology, or we can even say theology. The tools are not intruders. They're not intruders, like, like the tools are not spying on you. In other words, you know, the tools are not intruders. They are integrated into the culture, into the very culture in ways that do not pose significant contradictions to its worldview, to that particular culture's worldview. Now, just compare that, if you will, right, to compare this, if you will, to modern technopoly, to what we are confronted by in this um, um, society today. Their theology, ancient theology, took as a first and last principle that all knowledge and goodness come from God, comes from Jah, and that, therefore, all human enterprise, all human enterprise must be directed toward the service of God. This is a far cry, you understand, know from this end-time Gentile world civilization, from, from mystery Babylon. Theology, not technology, it provided people with authorization for what to do or think. It provided order and meaning to existence, making it almost impossible for techniques to subordinate people to its own needs. Unlike today, now people have to orientate themselves to their tools. In other words, they are serving their gods. They're serving their idols. You know, the idols that they make and call gods, they are enslaved to these things. According to Jah, according to God, the God of the Bible, the development of humanity's greatest potential takes first priority. All machines, all technology must be subordinate to human welfare. Did you get that? This is, this is a very important. Let's bring up, bring up the main, the main frame of this, this lecture right here, right? Behold, technopoly. According to Jah, according to the God of the Bible, the development of humanity's greatest potential takes first priority. All machines, all technology must, not may, but must be subordinate to human welfare. The most humble, impoverished human being is worth infinitely more than all computers and technological wonders combined. Now, if you don't think so, there's something wrong with you. You understand? And I hope you repent and recognize the truth of that statement. But today's unsustainable technology or technopoly, it rejects the word of Jah. It rejects the word of God as the foundation of knowledge. You see, the foundation of knowledge today is, is, is speculation. You understand? It's, it's speculation. Today's uh, society rejects the Bible, the foundation of, of knowledge, the foundation of knowledge. You remember what His Majesty said that when, um, you know, when, when, when humanity's like back is against the wall, then they're going to finally recognize, you understand, they're going to turn to the Bible in their last desperate hour. Let's bring Adam and Eve right here again, the Ethiopian Adam and Eve that were in the we could say the the utopian, the Ethiopian Aden, right? So today's unsustainable technopoly, it rejects to its own hurt the word of God as the foundation of knowledge. Technopoly, what it does is spiritually impoverishes our present civilization. It is a mixed bag of good and evil, which will eventually lead to death and destruction as it rejects the bedrock morality that defines, that gives definition 
to all human relationships. Ha Elohim, the true God, Elohe Israel, the God of Israel, the God and Father of our Black Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. On the other hand, He commands us to choose life, not just for ourselves, but also for our children, our nation and our world or society, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 to 14, and Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, for a biblical reference. John's word, it represents a sustainable way of life, unlike this Babylonian technopoly, which is sowing the seeds of its very own downstruction and destruction. Proverbs 14 and 12, it says that there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. But the good news, Jah's good news, the good news of the King of Kings and his Christ is that Jah has promised to establish a new society in the world ahead upon the trash heap of a collapsed so-called Babylonian technopoly. This new culture is called the kingdom of God, the kingdom of the king of kings and his Christ. It will subordinate technology to the word of Jah. In the future, in the very near future, humanity will not be considered less important than machines. Revelation chapter 21, Ezekiel chapters 40 to 48. Now, for those technopolis, you understand, whose religion is tech, uh, technopoly, who mock the primacy of the divine and the divinity of the king of kings and his Christ, the revelation of the tree of life, encompassed by the Holy Scriptures, that the Lord God, he issues this challenge from Isaiah chapter 46, verses 8 to 11. He says, he says to remember, he said to remember, to remember, let's bring the King of Kings, right, as witness, and this man here who bore true witness of Hila Selassie, um, who is Herbert Armstrong in The Plain Truth. You understand? He realized the truth. Unfortunately, some of his followers probably haven't, but hopefully they will before it's too late. Let's uh, um, issue this challenge that, the, that, that Yahweh Elohim, that the, the, the God of Israel, that Jah Rastafari issues to this Babylonian system. Remember this and consider. Call it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old. For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My purpose shall stand, and I will fulfill my intention. I have spoken, and I will bring it to pass. I have planned, and I will do it. So, my brothers and sisters, be awake and aware, you understand, of this uh, technopoly, you understand, this technopoly trap that humanity is, is, is currently in. Choose, as it says, choose the tree, choose the tree of life. You understand, not the tree, the mixed fruit, the tree of uh, so-called uh, knowledge of good and evil, but choose the tree of life, right? Life overcoming, you understand, life overcoming the valley of the dry bones, the skull and bones, you understand, rising victoriously above. My well, brothers and sisters, more to come on this. Once again, this particular article right here, just to close out on this, this Behold Technopoly 
from the world I had a very good article by Jeffrey H. Uh, Patton. It made John, you know, bless them for their contribution toward the spiritual sanity of, of the children of humanity. So, Shalom Rastafari. Stay tuned. More to come. Check us out on the web, www.lojsociety.org. I am Ras Yadinos Teferi Wendem Yadam. Shalom. <laughs>